ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Cage Talk. Today we have UFC veteran, fought in the UFC World Series of Fighting, fought in XFC, uh, was Ultimate Fighter, Season 2. We have the people, People's Warrior, we have Josh Berkman. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. I forget about some of that stuff till you remind me about it. It was a long career. You know what? That's funny because you're not the, the only person that actually told me that. They're like, man, I think I was talking to Chris Lieben and I was mentioning some of the stuff and he's like, man, just some of the stuff that you, you said like kind of brings back memories. And, and, that's, and that's one of the things I wanted to do, you know, just again, you had a stellar career regardless if it was in the UFC or if it was outside the UFC. And right. I mean, you helped pave, you know, the, this sport. And that's the best way I could do is give back to the MMA communities by talking and bringing you onto the channel. So again, thank you so much, man. Yeah, of course, no doubt. Lieben, man, that was, I trained with him way back when in Oregon. And I think, yeah, that's half the reason we forgot stuff from back then is because the way we <laughs> sparred back then. Definitely. It was, a uh, it was, uh, wing it, man. It was just winging it, especially those, the sparring. Yeah, the Team Quest days, I mean, me, Chris Lieben, Ed Herman, Randy Couture, Chel Sonnen, I mean, Matt Lindland, that room was the best room I'd ever been in. So Definitely. I mean, he, he was talking memories. about how he was like, he's like, yeah, I was one of the, the people on Team Quest. I mean, I remember he's like, my brother called me saying Matt Lindland and Randy Couture were kicking the crap out of each other. And he was like, I'm in, man, I'm in. So it, it's yeah. cool just uh, to hear stories like that, man. Yeah, I mean, they were in a garage in the back mm -hmm. of a car sales lot that ended up being what Team Quest was, you know. Definitely. So, so it, I came up and was like, this is the gym, huh? Okay, let's go. That's it, there man. There was more sweat and blood in that room in a vicious way than any other room, man. But it was such a brotherhood that was created. And we all made it. We all made it, you Definitely. know. And, and it was it's such a good group of guys, too, like uh, Ed Herman, you know, you're Matt Lindland, Chris um, – Chris Levin and also uh, Frank uh, yeah. Randy Couture. So again, it was, yeah. a, it was a good group yeah. of guys. Chael, oh, I'm shit talking, very humble. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. I, I met Chael. Um, where was it? It was in Vegas. I met him, and I was like, man, is is he still the same character, you know, off screen that he is? Like, and I was like, you know what? So I went to go see him, and this is when he was gonna have the uh, the Vandalay Silva fight, the second one. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, good luck on your fight. He's like, yeah, and I'm going to win just like I did last time. I was like, oh, that is perfect. I'm like, that, that's yeah. what I wanted yeah, to yeah. hear. <laughs> yeah, Chell's good people, man. He's, yeah. But I love, I love what he did with his smack talk and entertainment, too, and it got him a long, long way, you know. It, it really did. And um, career in broadcasting and everything. And he's, and he's pretty good at what he does, man. He's, he's very good at, at speaking and, and um, again, when I started this YouTube page, man, it was, it was kind of hard because again, it was weird talking, not very, not that I'm not bad at talking to people, but it's, it's different when you're having an interview or a conversation with someone, you have to like kind of intake what they're saying and still continue that conversation. And I mean, Chael does it to like the T and I, I'm, again, I stumble on my words and I do this and I do that. So it's a learning process, man. <laughs> it's a learning well, process. So far, so good. So far, so good. There you go, man. All right, let, let, let's talk about your career, man. Again, like I said, you fought in the UFC. You came out of the UFC. You went to the World Series of Fighting. Then you jumped back to the UFC. I mean, you had right. a couple of organizations that you fought with. Now, when you first started, you were in high school. You played multiple sports, right? You were a baseball player and a football player. Yeah, so I played – I wrestled. Mm -hmm. I played football and I played baseball in high school. And those were kind of like my – and basketball was actually my favorite sport. Really? So I played basketball up until I was a, a sophomore. And I played on the varsity team when I was in ninth grade. But my wrestling coach uh, in high school came to me and was like, why are you playing basketball? You're a 5'10 white guy. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, are you going to wrestle or play basketball? I was like, well, I want to play both. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, you need to wrestle. He's like, I heard you like to fight. Mm -hmm. He's like, you need to make sure you keep wrestling. And uh, he had me come into his classroom and he showed me a wrestling video of Matt Hughes at Iowa. Mm -hmm. And then in a couple of these UFC fights. Okay. And I was like, I'll see you wrestling practice. And that was <laughs> during it. baseball season, but that was what made, gave me the, that's what helped me make the choice to be a, a wrestler in high school, which is really 
my you know original background in martial arts and and what I initially started my professional fight career with just wrestling training you know Absolutely. yeah and uh, then I, went, I played baseball and football in college and then I was transferring from Dixie State to the University of Utah on a full ride scholarship okay and I had my first uh fight uh that it was an NHB fight okay that uh that summer transferring mm -hmm. and after I fought I was like Oh, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. You're, you're hooked. Gave up my scholarship and set on and became a professional fighter, and that's how it started. There you and go, then man. for 17 years, I was able to make a living and do nothing else but fight. And that was, I lived a dream. You know, no matter what it was, I was able to just fight for 17 years and just train martial arts. And I feel like it was a blessing for sure. Definitely, man. And and again, um, 17 years that especially putting your body through, you know those workouts and training. I mean, that, that, that takes a toll on your body, man. But again, um, you're, you're awesome. Like I said, you were awesome in the cage. Loved it. Everything about you. And you do have one, one fight that I want to talk about later on where, uh, it was the John Finch, the second one. Cause that, that one to me, man, that, uh, no one's seen that fight. I mean, that was probably the most badass fight ending ever. I mean, you were the the fighter and the ref, and you just you, you told you told them when the, the the fight was over, which it was super cool, man. It was, it was really cool. Well, you know, it that was probably the the peak of my career. You know what I mean? And it was it was it happened in a very like cool uh, way, you know. And for me, you know, when I when I first fought John Fitch back in the yeah. UFC in two thousand seven. I was the top 10 fighter in the world and John Fitch was the guy trying to make a name for himself. Definitely. You know, I had just beat Drew Fickett, who was number seven. I had just beat uh, Sam Morgan, you know, mm -hmm. and Fickett had just come off a win over John Fitch or not John Fitch, Josh Koscheck. Yep. Josh Koscheck was highly touted, you know, and then I went and submitted uh, Drew Fickett and, minute and 41 seconds you know and so i was like i'm the best bring it <laughs> and you know uh before i fought fitch three weeks out i broke my foot okay so and and two and i and i was you know i was like i'm gonna beat this dude no matter what mm -hmm. whether i can move or not you know I, that's just where i was at in my career at 27 26 years old and and where i was at Mentality, you know, and, then, and i lost that fight and then i was kind of up and down after that you know because i was partying every bit as much as i was an mma fighter you know like we were living a rock star lifestyle too you know yeah, you know it and um the but then i got i got injured mm -hmm. and at 29 I, I had really bad herniated discs and and, and and some bad neck injuries and the doctors told me my career was over and i should retire and so i did at 29 i retired and and i had i didn't want my career to be over you know, I, I worked really hard on different kinds of healing modalities. I got to work with a lot of healers and professionals and psychiatrists, sports psychologists, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was able to get cleared by the doctors without getting surgery that I, I was able to come back. And before that, I, I would, if I would have had to retire then, I would have had a lot of regret mm -hmm. because I for sure think I could have been the best fighter in the world and a world champion. You know, if I wouldn't have had all those extracurricular activities in my life, you know, yeah, and, and uh, so then, you know, being able to come back and being able to like be better than I had ever been. Mm -hmm. When I got to fight John Fitch, it was like, if I can beat Fitch, I'll be better than I ever was. And if I can get over this neck injury and be better than I ever was. I'll have no regret and I'll have no resentment like in, and I'll be able to let fighting go and move on to what's next in my life. Gotcha. And so that's, I think what that moment was with John Fitch is, is, is I got to get my career back. I got to get back into a place where I got to fight the number one fight, number three fighter in the world. And I had no doubt in all my interviews, I'm like, I'm going to beat this dude in the first minute of the first round. Like he has no chance. Yeah. And, and, and all my interviews, I would say that leading up to this fight, Mm -hmm. And then when I tapped him out in 41 seconds, I just, you know, it was like, he's out. I'm going to roll him over and let everybody know this is over. Really and I rolled him cool. over and put my hand up. And that was probably that, that for me, uh, completed the, the comeback in a sense for me. 
you know, and, and gave me a lot of uh, clarity. And it, like I said, that was, that was the best moment in my career for sure, because of what it, what it meant for me and coming back from injuries and, and, and where I was at in my career and in my life at that point, you know, and, and Fitch had a lot of, a lot of people watching him cause he had just got let out of the UFC said yeah. he could beat anybody. And I was like, no, nah, I'm better than anybody in the world right now, bro. I'm going to prove it. <laughs> it was, uh, you, when you locked it on, you, you already knew he was out. That's why you flipped him over. He was, it was done. Yeah, it was, and it was it a wasn't, position for the ref. I think. Yeah. It wasn't a traditional guillotine. It was like it a DDT. Yeah, I you know what I mean. Like I locked his neck, I cranked him, and I slammed his head into the mat, and he was disoriented when his head hit the mat. And then, you know, who was it? Jake the Snake Roberts used to hit the DDT, right? <laughs> yep. And everybody's always, even Boss Rutten's like, "Oh, he shouldn't have put him in his in the half guard." And I'm like, "No, that ain't the guillotine you guys are thinking. That's more catch wrestling, and mm -hmm. that's why he was out so quick, mm -hmm. is because it was a different kind of a neck crank than just on the esophagus." Gotcha. You know? And if I wouldn't have let him go, I could have broke his neck, you know, like, but I like Fitch. I got nothing but respect for Fitch. And that's why I let it go when I let it go. I mean, regard it just shows you you're, again, like you're a class act. I mean, and it just, everything fell into place in that fight, right? And Absolutely. Just, I mean, it just, again, that's one of the, like, the I, I have that picture of you just standing over with your hand it's just it's just a badass moment it's like something from a movie man it's, it's, it was, like i said that was you know you see that picture of ali where he's standing he over this in first minute first round i have that picture in my office forever and go. it's like at some point when i care to put up memorabilia that might that picture might replace the ali one first there minute you go, first man. round you know what yeah, i'm saying so another interesting story is uh my wife was pregnant with my second little boy okay and we were trying to come up with names and Atlas Shrug was mine and my wife at the time's favorite book. Okay. And John Fitch, me and him were talking and, and we were cool. You know, he's asking me about being a dad and, and, you know, I think his wife might've been pregnant at the same time or they were trying to get pregnant. Okay. And he was, I was, we were talking about names and he's like, yeah, I'm thinking about naming my little boy Atlas. And I was like, well, how about this? If I beat you, I'm going to steal that little name and I'm going to call my little boy Atlas. But if you beat me, I won't take it. And he's like, deal. And we shook heads. And, and there I you go. Him. That's your second child. My little boy's name is Atlas. That's, that's <laughs> an awesome story. That's cool, man. Right? Imagine, so imagine I also appreciate lost. it for helping me name, name Atlas. That's awesome, man. And It's just crazy how, how things uh, unfold, man. Unfold in, in your very eyes and that, that, Absolutely. That, that's a, a really fascinating story. Again, yeah. you started, I know we, we kind of went the opposite, but it's fine. We started with your, your most memorable moments. Now, when you started, you know, you were supposed to be in the Ultimate Fighter Season 1, correct? Yep. You ended up being in Ultimate Fighter Season 2, which is cool. I mean, I, right, that, right. it still had a, a great group. A group. How, how was that experience? The Ultimate Fighter was uh, what. So when I was originally on season one, right? I was on. Lieben was on, and they wanted me to fight at two hundred five. So I would have been fighting like, you know, who was it? Forrest Griffin and those dudes, which I still would have smoked them. But <laughs> I wasn't training for the Ultimate Fighter. You know, like uh, my buddy had just gotten drafted by the Phoenix Suns. He was living in Scottsdale. I was like, yo, I'm coming. Let's go. Because <laughs> so, he was my college roommate, too, you know. And, mm -hmm. and we always had dreamed about the moments of becoming professional athletes. And I thought I was going to be a football player. He knew he was going to be a basketball player. And we had bets about who was going to become the athlete first, who was going to buy each other the first cars. You know, like, <laughs> so when he got drafted, it was like, I'm coming. And we were partying pretty hard, you mm -hmm. know, like. And, and, and that's how it was back then, you know, it was fight, party, fight, party, train, you know, Definitely. and um, I was in Scottsdale when I got the call, hey, Josh, you're on the ultimate fighter. And I was like, oh, okay, I better go home. So <laughs> I ended up going home and I had like three weeks to train and my buddy was like, you know, I was like, man, I'm, I need to like get in shape quick. And my buddy was like, you should take some Winstraw. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I should for sure. Yeah, there it is. There was in the early days, there was no tests, you know, it was like, it was free range. It was, it was different. And when I got there, they told me that they were testing, uh, that, that they weren't testing us. Okay. And then 
they brought us back just for a test as, as to, to test us for steroids. And I tested positive. Mm-hmm. But I told them when they tested me, I'm like, yo, listen, I'm going to test positive for cocaine, marijuana, steroids. They're like, well, just take the test. And they're like, what have you been doing? I'm like, not training for a fight. You know, and I was like, <laughs> and, and that, for me, it's easy. I, you know, I'm, I'm very like clean living, holistic now. And it's easy for me to talk about those things because there's a lot of lessons and things like that in, in, in my shortcomings, you know, and as there was with the Ultimate Fighter. So, um, I packed for Ultimate Fighter 1. I was on my way to the airport, mm-hmm. and Craig Polizian called me and goes, you didn't pass your tests. And I, so I was getting – I mean, I, I told my whole high school football team, I'm leaving, I'm going to be on the Ultimate Fighter. Oh, wow. And then I wasn't on. They mm-hmm. told me I was off, and, and I had to go home, and I had to explain to my family. I had to explain to my athletes at the, on the football team, everybody that, like, listen – I'm not going because of the choices that I made. And um, at the time they weren't testing and I didn't, you know, like, like I said, it was, it was a different situation, but it was kind of like what really helped. um, I think like stabilize the sport and help it grow was like that kind of testing in the UFC, you know? And so I ended up, but Craig called me back and he's like, man, we love you. Like you're, you know, he's like, and if, if this show's successful and there's a season two, you're going to be on it but you need to clean up your act and he's like and if nothing else you should just clean up your act in life in general you know yeah and i did that you know i quit drinking i quit partying for a while um and i really like got focused that there was going to be a season two and um i took a couple more fights won those fights they said they called me up said there's going to be a season two we want you on at 170 pounds and i was like let's do it and and, and then i got to go on and when we first got there I was like, okay, there's some tough dudes here. Mm-hmm. And then we started training and I got to train with Melvin and Joe Stevenson and I threw those dudes around, you know, and, and, and Matt Hughes was like, you're going to win the show. You know, he's like, I'm going to pick you to get on my team. That's awesome. And, and, and that's exactly what happened except for Melvin broke my arm and I was, I wasn't able to be, you know, the ultimate fighter champ. But I think there's no doubt I would have beat anybody on that show had I had the opportunity to do it, you know, but those were all, like I said, good lessons. And Dana was like, Hey, I know you broke your arm. And I fought Sam. I fought Melvin Glard. He Mm -hmm. kicked me in the arm, snapped. It was a completely snapped my arm in the half or arm in half in the second round. And then, but I beat him in a decision. And Dana came and got me after and was like, listen, I know your arm's broken. You're not going to be able to compete the show, but go home, get better, and I'll give you an opportunity to get a UFC contract. And that's what happened. I fought Sam Morgan on that finale, beat him in 21 seconds. Remember that fight. Yeah, that was that was a good moment too. You know, yeah. like that was 25-year-old kid getting an opportunity to get a UFC contract. And I put Sam Morgan out in 21 seconds, you know. So that was that was every bit as – equally as cool as the moment of beating Fitch, except for a different kind of reward. You know what I mean? Fitch was more coming back from struggle, coming back from, from it being over. And Sam Morgan was like, nah, starting off. Like, yeah. I deserve this. I'm going to beat yeah. this dude, you know? So yeah, that's kind of how it all started in the UFC. You know? And at that point, I think I had probably like 15 20 fights you know and i retired at the end with 40 47 fights yep. you know so it was a good career and a lot i put in a lot of work over those next 10 years definitely man and then again um like i said uh with if it was not in the ufc it was, you know world series of fighting i mean i loved watching you but um there was one point where you you grew out your beard i mean your beard was intense man I mean, right right well when was that because i know i have a picture of you for for uh for the show that has as a thumbnail and it's the only one i could get you but you have a full-on beard like (laughs) so what i what i when i first got in the ufc what i would do is for fight camps i would grow my beards out definitely and then soon as i uh would get done with my weight cut before we went into way i would shave my face so i always showed up on the scale with this clean face because gotcha. like, the work's over now let's just go perform gotcha. and that was kind of like my method for years okay and then when i came back i would grow out my beard and i would i would 
uh, not shave. And so I started fighting with these beards. And, and then sometimes I would shave them after the fights. <laughs> but then I was, uh, there was two periods where I was like, I'm just not going to shave until I lose. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the very end of my career, I just grew it out for a year. So it was only a year, you know? And, but I remember I was, there was a couple of times, you know, where I was like, I'm going to shave. No, I'm not. <laughs> and that last period in the UFC mm -hmm. with where it just got it dark. Was yeah, yeah it was, man it was, it was crazy i remember you know watching your fights i'm like shit is, is that is that is that him I'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> and two it was funny because a lot of people recognize me as the clean face shaven face so when i have a beard people don't always recognize me but when i <laughs> shave my face everybody always is like oh berkman yeah. but when i have my beard nobody even it's like That's funny. Well, you, you, you can always you can always switch it up when you don't want to be bothering some just grow out your beard you're good to well, go so now too i had it for a year uh -huh. And I shaved it a couple months ago for the summer. And then I just started growing it out again. And I'm going to grow it for two years this time. So oh, I'm going to wow. see if it, but I mean, I'm having a feeling it's going to be like this. So hey, I'm not going to shave for two years and I'm about a week in. I, I really want uh, the next, I'm, I'm going to, not that you're not going to come back on, but when you do come back on, I do want to see you with that beard, man. So we can yeah. have a before and after, like the very first time you were on the show and then now. So uh, and I'll give you, I'll give you like a, every six months, every six months, that, I'll throw you a shot and be like, there we go, out. man. <laughs> that's awesome. Now, and, but that's, yeah, that was always the thought. And I always like the stories of, I'm fascinated with the history of the beards and how the women in, in, in Egypt used to like color them on and wear mm -hmm. fake ones. And, you know, and like the, 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 the statues of the, the greek gods their beards are long and flowing and, and and samson and delilah and how he lost his strength you know and it's like i feel like that's part of the things too is like grow the beard you know sometimes through a cleansing but i really feel like i'm in a period of my life of of righteousness and serviceness and, and it has to do with martial arts and and i think that's my my goal is to to serve my students and my and the people that I'm teaching and help them to become their highest self. And my beard is just a reflection of like the next two years is me being a teacher and trying to serve people through through martial arts. Awesome. And now you can um, tell people what you're doing now. I know you have, um, you know, you're you're taking you're doing classes and stuff and teaching classes and stuff. Like that. If you can right, reflect right. a little bit on that. Well, so I. I really retired from the UFC two years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I retired, I got neck surgery. Okay. And they went in and did disc replacing on, on my C5 and C6. And I didn't know for sure exactly what I was going to do, you know. And luckily, I had saved money and given myself some time to try to figure that out. And um, then a year later, uh, I decided to do one more fight just to come back from my neck surgery and, and, and see if I could do it. And I could, and it, it went good. And, you know, I, I started teaching about three months before that fight, you know, and it just kind of, kind of came up and, 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 but I didn't know that I wanted anything to do with the, the sport of MMA anymore. You know, and I, I just didn't know exactly what direction I was going to go. Um, whether it be a yoga teacher, whether it be a breath coach, a life coach, whatever, you know, I, I didn't know exactly. And then I started teaching and I started to really like fall in love with my students and, and watching them progress in martial arts and deal with like anger issues or anxiety issues and, and, and not have those anymore because of the way that we were teaching and doing things, you know? And uh -huh. then I decided that I really wanted to like be a teacher and a coach, you know? And then over the last uh, six months ago, I had a, 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 a guy named Dan Barry who um, owns a school called integrated martial arts asked me if I wanted to take his gym over and it couldn't have been like better timing period, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I took that gym over about six months ago and we were really building some steam and then COVID hit. And then when the COVID hit, I was just like, really what I want to do is I just want to hang out with my kids, yeah. you know? And so I started some kids camps and, um, but part of what I wanted to teach was teach people, when I heal, hurt my neck, I got to go through um, basically the, the um, Nevada Institute of Sports Science did a case study on me about trying to heal the vertebrae in the neck and the nucleus and, and all this. And we did it through a holistic lifestyle, a raw food diet, breath work, and the optics, right? And, 
it was amazing to me that all this information was out there and yet nobody had ever taught it to me. And, and so I went and also found, um, I don't know whether I found them or they found me, but I've found over these last five, 10 years, uh, traditional martial arts teachers that, that we talked about, like the honor and the virtue in martial arts and, and, and also how that surpasses technique and the life force within the body and, and all those things, you know? And so I started teaching martial arts in a more traditional way. And, okay. and I really was uh, focused on teaching kids. And so now I'm running adult class and kids classes, but we talk about meditation. We talk about breath. We talk about posture and then how martial arts, yoga and mobility help in those things. And I've went and got a yoga certificate, a certified yoga certificate from Budokan, uh, which is a full martial arts system of mobility, yoga, and then all the traditional martial arts, you know. And I've done, a, I've got a mobility certificate. And I think my, you know, and I also went and got my black belt from Dan Barry. Um, and now we're just, you know, we're doing that. And what we're doing now is we have a 501c3, a nonprofit called Caring for Kids. Okay. And we're really, my goal in the end is to get martial arts training for kids all over the state of Utah for free. Um, and then we also have a private school that we're starting where kids are going to come in. We start in September for kids that are being homeschooled because a lot of kids are going to homeschool now with yeah. COVID-19. So basically my goal is to start a modern day Western Shaolin temple where these kids, they come in and this is what they do now. And this is what they'll do in September mm -hmm. is they come in and we start with meditation and breath work. And after we do the meditation and breath work, we do uh, mobility, animal movements, crawling patterns, which are all basically like animal movements and jujitsu shadow boxing, gotcha. right? Different yeah. ways of moving without just by yourself, you know? And then um, after they do that, we play Nerf guns or water guns and, uh, they get to play a little bit. This is my new cat. He just showed up. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> this is Tiger. My boys talked me into getting Tiger the other day. Well, there you go, man. So, no, I did see yeah. something on your Instagram. Now, it, it was something, I don't know if it was the, what you were doing now, or it was maybe like, it was, it looked like it was almost like a cabin out in the woods. Right, right. What was that about? Because that looked really cool. Because again, there was a big living room. It was just all mats and it was a bunch of people. I was like, man, that looked cool. And then there was a like campfire and people were making, you were making s'mores. And shit. I was jealous. I was like, damn, I want to do that. Right. What's that so about? What, is that part of that? Is, the school that where my, where my teacher is, where I've got a lot of my, my yoga and mobility certifications and things like that is it's called Budokan. Okay. B-U-D-O-K-O-N. And Budokan and Budokan University is, is what the Instagram is. And what Budokan is, is Budokan is a mixture between calisthenics, mobility, yoga, and martial arts. Gotcha. There's a black belt jujitsu system, which is the Bar Bar uh, Gracie Barra system. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it basically has all those pillars of movement because the principle of yoga, it's martial arts. It's why it's a sword fight. It's warrior one, warrior two, warrior three. And, and Cameron Shane is the, my teacher. And he's the one that has this, he's moved from Montana to, uh, or from Miami to Montana. Okay. And he bought a little a piece of property there and they got a retreat center and really anybody who's interested in yoga, martial arts, and, and, and movement in general um, should, should look into it. And it's, they have a, it's at the Glacier National Forest, and it's a pretty incredible thing. So you can just look up Budokan and kind of see what that is. And that's what's given me the idea. I've always been a yogi, and I've always been an athlete, and I've always been a martial artist. Well, not always been a martial artist. I was a fighter. Now I'm very much more a martial artist. And that's, that's what I teach is, is, is the, under this Budokan system. And, and, and that's what it is. And then that's what we're going to do with these kids too. You know, where they come in, they do their meditation, then they do their mobility. After they do their mobility, they do their martial arts and then they do their yoga. And then they go and they grab their computers and they get on the mats and they do two hours of their online homework. So they're doing lots of movement. It's a movement school. And then they go and they get their logic, but it's not just logic because you need to be able to have both those things, you know, and, and that's what I want to, 
that's what we're after is to teach people how to move and to teach people how to breathe and to have good posture because i think that's the rebellion against the 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 society going through what we're going through putting us in a in a technological bubble that 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 that, that almost you know takes away our freedom i think that's what's happening you know and i want to i want to teach these little humans how to move and be and be free and have other options besides selling technology and, yep. and apps you know that's teach them to be the, the warrior spirit the martial arts but not only the warrior spirit but the yogi also which is the more peaceful side of us you know yeah definitely man again like i like i said i, I was jealous seeing all your your Instagram post, I'm like, man, like that, that looks cool. You guys are out in a lake. And I was like, shit, that looks. Yeah. Cool. And that's it, man. Just, just being more in touch with nature, being more, <laughs> more like the samurai, being more like, you know, the, the, just, just that kind of like warrior. That's like I said, I, th- I think part of our job is to not, not to be here to use the animals and to use the earth, but to be a part of that and to take care of the animals and to take care of the earth, you know? And definitely. I, I think that there's, definitely a separation that's happening right now in those things and i just want to i i think the warrior spirit is very much in touch with the laws of nature you know definitely man that and again that that's all that's all that's interesting as hell man and again i i hope uh nothing but good fortune man so just keep going at it I, again who wouldn't want to be uh taught by you know josh burke man that, that's cool man that's really cool well, thanks i think the hardest part too is you know, for me is, is transitioning from that role to a fighter, to a teacher and a coach, because I'm not trying to just teach people to get into the UFC. You know, I'm teaching, I'm using martial arts to try to teach people how to have uh, health and longevity in their life, Definitely. you know, and it's like, oh, who's this guy to teach that? You know, yeah. but it's like, man, I've been through so many injuries and so many, uh, so many things I've had to endure that have taught me about the body and about breath work and about just life you know and it's like i feel like um martial arts has been like such a spiritual journey that i never knew it would be for me and and now like i said i want to just you know pass those lessons on to the to the next generation and again like try to help people heal and try to help people deal with their things so that they can stand with good breath and good posture to go through the you know to endure the things that life gives us (laughs) you know your sons go with you yeah, yeah. So the, my yeah. sons are pretty much the the guides in it. You know, they're like, I don't love school. I don't want to sit in a desk. <laughs> and then, like I said, I said, two years, give me two years. I'll have school. You don't have to um, go to school anymore. You can come to our school, our martial arts movement school. But then COVID-19 happened and six months yeah. later, we got a school. And um, so I, I think that's a big part of it is, you know, just I want to, I want my kids to learn the arts. I want them to learn yoga and martial arts and how to breathe. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've had kids come in with anxiety. I've had kids come in with, um, I've dealt with kids with autism. I've dealt with kids with ADHD. And once we turn these kids, teach these kids how to breathe. And once we teach them how to keep their posture, their, their, their anxiety goes away. Their stress goes away. Their ADHD goes away. We don't, we don't have ADHD at our gym. As soon as they come in and get to move, their their learning problems are gone because there are that's all they want to do. Move. ADHD is when I say sit in a desk. Yep. And do your work and don't move. It's like ah, you know I what know. I mean? Like Definitely. we don't we don't have we don't have those issues. And and and, and our kids, um, and I think our parents see the benefits of what we're creating in our school for these kids. That's awesome, man. Again, like yeah. I said, you keep going with that. that- sounds like you you're onto something and and i I hope everything works out for you thanks man it's like anything else too you know i think fighting you know is everybody's like why are you going to be a fighter you put so much into football and i'm like because it's going to work like um and people didn't believe necessarily that it was going to work till it started working and they're like best choice ever yeah yeah then after it's oh you did good man yeah Yeah, and even being a, a teacher i mean Dana, I, I had an opportunity to go to Vegas and, and mm-hmm. work for Dana White in the UFC. I had an opportunity to run a unbreakable gym inside the Rio okay. and, and, and make $200,000 a year just showing up running this gym, you know, and I chose to stay in Utah and to work as a teacher and an instructor and to build this school because I feel like this is my purpose. You know, I think that, that everything that I've been through has it's given me the knowledge today. and the wisdom to, to be able to teach this stuff that I'm that I'm teaching you know and 
I think that there's a growing period, you know, and it's like when I first started, there was one person in class and two people in class. And now we're starting to like grow and build and, and, and it's like anything else. It just takes a period of time and it takes that consistent work. But eventually the goal is to have three schools and a property in, in Montana and a retreat center and, mm -hmm. and just have multiple places that people can learn about the, 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 the arts of the body and the way to breathe and, places to be in the highest self where it's happy and joyful and that's, that's, awesome. that's what we're after you know that's awesome again i just want to just before we wrap it up i want i want to say the thank you for for everything you put inside the octagon and even outside because that's the most important thing is not only what you did in your past as a fighter but you know your legacy what you leave behind now as you know your new career starts and again giving back to the community, you know, helping out kids and, and building the school um, is an, another great opportunity. And, and it, that's awesome. And I want to thank you for that, man. Well, thanks, man. And I, like I said, I feel like I had a, a MMA career that I feel like I could hang my hat on and be good with, you know, but I, I feel like there's just so much more to do. And I said this, I said, I hope when I'm done being, teaching these kids and building my school people forget I was ever a fighter and just you know look at me as like a great teacher and that's where that's where I'm headed now you know I want to and like I said it's gonna take a period of time you know but eventually I want to be known for being a great teacher not a great fighter perfect and again uh thank you so much for coming you're always more than welcome to come back on again with the beard I want to see that beard man so. We'll come back in a year, and then we'll come back in two, and eventually, I think it'll be off the off the picture eventually. That's awesome. But again, thank you so much for everything, ladies and gentlemen. Josh Berkman, thank you so much, bud. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. No problem, buddy.